Hello and welcome to News Click. Last December, NASA had a press conference in which they claimed that they had found some interesting uh, evidence to show that extraterrestrial life was possible. What they finally came out with was really an arsenic eating bug in Lake Mono. The question is, did NASA really hype this thing up to support or garner more public support even though the science of what was being discussed is still very important. The fact that arsenic could substitute for one of the building blocks, phosphorus, in the DNA chain. It's an important result by itself. But the hype that NASA seems to have put on it wasn't justified by what the results were finally shown. Of course, the scientists have come out very strongly in large numbers, saying that the, this is an extraordinary claim that you have a DNA chain minus phosphorus substituted by arsenic and it does not have enough supporting evidence to give for such an extraordinary claim. In fact, the evidence could be quite regarded as quite ordinary or even shoddy. This has been a, a controversy in the scientific circles. It's now uh, eight comments on this though has been printed in science. The original uh, paper had come out in science. And the, of course, the authors have defended themselves. So this has become a huge controversy. To discuss this issue and also certain other issues, how self-correcting is science, we have today with us Dr. Satyajit Rath from National Institute of Immunology. Satyajit, good to have you back with us. Thank you. Let's look at the basic scientific claim being made that you can substitute arsenic for phosphorus in the DNA which was thought to really hold the DNA scaffold up. Well, part of that also participates in other very important cell functions. How substantive is this claim that is being made and what is its current status? There isn't a simple answer despite the fact that we apparently have a paper published in a very high profile journal um, that seems to suggest that there is an answer. Yet there isn't when you look at the data an answer to this question. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because the paper shows data that make it possible that there is arsenic associated with the DNA of this bacterium. But arsenic being associated with the DNA of this bacterium and arsenic being incorporated into the structure of this DNA of this bacterium are two entirely different kettles of fish. All said and done, if you take a child and you let the child play outdoors, the child will come back covered with mud. The mud is associated with the child, but that doesn't mean that the mud is an intrinsic, has become an intrinsic part of the child's body structure. Um, in other words, you can always wash the mud off, presumably. Um, and really, the paper has amongst its many other limitations, this limitation that the nature of the incorporation of arsenic into the DNA structure has not been clearly demonstrated. As a matter of fact, many of the comments in science that are critical of this paper and that science has published um, address this particular question. So, the paper if you read gives you a completely different impression from the impression you would get if you read the hype around the paper. The hype around the paper, um, Felisa, I think her name is Wolf Simon, uh, being on the cover of Glamour magazine, being uh, uh, rated as one of the 100 most influential people, women, scientists, something or the other by some advertising gimmick or another. All of this would create a completely different impression altogether. The paper itself is far more soberly written. The paper says the following things. They found a bacterium that originated in Mono Lake in California, which is a high salt containing low nutrients including phosphorus containing uh, lake. Then they have subjected sediment from this lake, not even a bacterium from this lake, a sediment from this lake, mud from this lake to high arsenic low phosphorus growth environments and after many, 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 many generations they have come up with a bacterium that seems to survive on exceedingly low levels of phosphorus 
and despite exceedingly high levels of arsenic. To the extent that the protein, the fat and the DNA content of this bacterium seems to contain extraordinarily low amounts of phosphorus and seems to be associated with extraordinarily high amounts of arsenic. This is the sum and substance of the paper. The only additional point in the paper that is interesting is that if you take away the arsenic in the growth environment of this bacterium, the bacterium stops growing. Now, they have been using this as an argument to say that the bacterium uses arsenic. But it is equally possible that the presence of arsenic allows the bacterium to use phosphorus more efficiently. This very small amounts of phosphorus that are present in the growth environment may be used more efficiently by the bacterium in the presence of high levels of arsenic. There are other uh, bacteria which in fact do something very similar. So, it is quite plausible. This evidence has been used for two separate things. One, to publish a very high profile journal uh, paper and two, for NASA to call a, a press advisory, to issue a press advisory saying that it is possible that life is far more plastic than we had thought it is. Now, certainly, life is pretty plastic, we know that already. Whether it is as plastic as this or not, the jury is still out. NASA in fact almost made it out that they have a made a new discovery which in fact could even support the idea there are two origins of life on earth, a as if there is this an independent origin of life, in fact talked of even shadow biospheres and so on. This was really something not warranted by what the paper was saying. Let us get something clear. There is no claim in the paper nor is there any indication in the data that this bacterium is an independently derived form of life for two reasons amongst many, two major reasons amongst many. One, that it is actually derived from sediment by putting that sediment in a, an experiment reminiscent of Louis Pasteur, putting that sediment into growth environments containing progressively more and more arsenic. Clearly, this is adapting an original bacterium to very high levels of arsenic, which is not at all indicative of an independent arsenic dependent origin. Secondly, you take this bacterium and you give it, instead of arsenic, you give it phosphorus and it grows much better in the paper itself than it grows in arsenic. So, clearly, this is not a bacterium that cannot use phosphorus that uses arsenic instead. So, therefore, the independent origin of life is simply out of the room. There is, there is no way to suggest that. For anybody, including NASA, including the authors, to be suggesting that is simply being carried away either uh, out of sheer excitement or perhaps more calculated motives uh, with the hype. You know, if we really look at it, this is currently this is also becoming obvious that if there is a high profile claim in science, then this will and you are going to hype it up in public domain. The media was called, the way this NASA had framed its press conference, it appeared they have almost discovered extra, extraterrestrial life form. So, if you hype it in this way, obviously the peer discussion will also take place in public domain. The authors at one point said, we do not really respond to blogosphere and so on, but they are quite happy to, for instance, Felisa uh, Wolf Simon went to TED lecture and she made various claims and you have quoted the Glamour magazine. They do not seem to have so much problems about responding to the public domain as much to public criticism in the blogosphere or other uh, modes of criticism by the scientific community itself. All right. So, this I will say in uh, support of the authors. The authors have done everything that you can expect scientists to do when a controversy arises. Number one, they have responded formally to the technical criticisms of their work that have been conveyed to them by the journal in which they were attempting to publish the paper. They have responded at length. With some, they have taken an honest difference of opinion as their stand. With some criticisms, they have actually said that this is preliminary work. We acknowledge that if this were to turn out to be correct as a reservation, our claims would not stand scrutiny. We will wait and see. 
we are working on this. Secondly, they have actually made this, this bacterium available to other workers. In other words, they have not sat on this bacterium and said, we have a bacterium and we are not going to give it to anybody, but this is what we have discovered. In the best traditions of science, they have made this bacterium available. Now, the bacterium grows slowly, there are small amounts, they are a small lab, um, there have been problems, but they have certainly given the bacterium to more than one independently working group for validation. Eventually, I am sure we will hear. Let me add a point about NASA's hype. You know, I can sort of understand where they are coming from. All said and done, this is a lab that is in the process of disassembly. Um, Felisa Wolf Simon herself does not have a permanent position in this laboratory. The laboratory does not do this kind of work as their primary work. In fact, the senior author of the laboratory is from the US Geological Survey. Um, NASA's just had its shuttle program shut down. The shuttle made its last flight a few days ago. In general, basic science funding agencies, not simply in the United States, but all over the world, are feeling pressured by the neoliberal view of science, which is that science is done to gain something, preferably for companies to make. In this atmosphere, it's not surprising. I'm not suggesting that one should be uh, doing this oneself, but it's understandable if science agencies that do basic science that does not have any immediate implication in the corporate world tend to resort to gimmickry to drum up as a little bit of support for their bottom line budgets. Well, in this sense, what you are saying today, we are seeing increasingly science really turned to as much to popular media as to scientific journals. And in fact, it's clear that if you do have a high public profile, then funds, grants, all this seem to become a little easier. So effectively, we are seeing a certain kind of science taking place today. How science is being done, how science is being communicated, which is changing. Absolutely, it's certainly changing. Um, what's interesting in this case is that it's not the individual scientists themselves who initiated the hype. One is expect, expecting individual scientists to hype their findings. All said and done, you know, I don't go out and say that my baby is the ugliest thing in the universe. Um, but that it was NASA, the institutional agency, which attempted to do this. And that, I think, reflects the levels of institutional anxiety about basic science funding. I repeat myself, not simply in the United States, but globally. The other interesting thing about this that we might want to keep in mind, what does it take to publish a paper in science becomes an operative issue for scientists rather than saying, what does it take for me to change a prevailing dogma in science, to change a prevailing concept, a prevailing theory in science. And that shift from trying to decide how much weight of evidence I need to put together to change a theory in the minds of my fellow scientists versus how much evidence does it take to publish a paper in a high profile journal, I'm not sure that that's a desirable change and shift. That's a, that, that's a change that has occurred quite radically over the past 50 years suddenly. And we have seen it steadily marching onwards. In a certain sense, it's a corporate culture uh, acclimatization of how science is done. More the ad world, if you will. Coming back to a certain point which has now been made, in fact, by Carl Zimmer in the New York Times article, where he says that the prevailing view is science is self-correcting. But no leading scientist is going to do a study to replicate what has been done by Felisa Wolf Simon and her group because it does not have any mileage. The replication studies are not really something which give you academic brownie points. It, students who want to do it would blight their career. So if the prevailing view is that this science was shoddy science, as it seems to be, then there is really no replication studies that is likely to be done. And also, if negative findings are there, no journal will publish it. 
Therefore, science in that sense does not invest in this way on the negative findings, gives much more value to positive findings, and this way, in, in fact, can perpetuate mistakes and uh, actually create a hell of a lot of waste. As a general formulation, I think you're perfectly right. However, in a curious twist, in this particular case, that formulation may not quite apply. And let me explain why I'm saying that. In the first place, um, I would not like to leave the impression that I think that, this, that the paper that was actually published, the data, the text, the interpretations, the conclusions in that paper were shoddy science. I think that they were a limited set of findings that were discussed with appropriate caveats. But when is Simon has said, Wolf Simon has said that arsenic replaced phosphorus in the DNA chain. That's really a claim that she's been making and her co-authors have been making. I understand, but I am talking about the published paper. See, for scientists, it's the published paper that counts, or at least is supposed to count. Um, whether it in reality does so or not is a whole different um, can of worms. But Sadhguru, she was in the press conference where it was said publicly arsenic has replaced phosphorus. I understand, phosphorus. but in their paper, they do not say this. And in that sense, I am making the limited point that the paper is not shoddy science. Um, remember, we do not hold the science that scientists do as being as reprehensible as the scientists themselves quite frequently. We have many examples of people who are quite terrible people. This is not to suggest that Wolf Simon is a terrible person, but we have many examples of people who are terrible people who have done outstanding science and have received Nobel Prizes and other such uh, hype generating devices uh, in their lives. The paper makes modest conclusions. But because it was a hyped paper, in fact, replication is going to be done and is going to have publication value. Now, that's because there was hype to the paper. If it had been published in current science, your formulation would apply, certainly. There would be no replication, nobody would notice, it would die without a ripple. Yet, a modest set of data, because they are published in a high-profile journal, have actually invited the triggering of a self-correction process in science that we would fondly hope is always present. And what I am trying to say is that it is not always present. That the terrain for the triggering of self-correction processes in science is deeply unequal. In fact, a lot of the dead ends in science are not really known because the authors or researchers who came across the dead ends after publishing say five or six papers, they would stop publishing. Absolutely. There are a whole lot of people in India, for instance, who do not know why they have stopped, would continue down that path. So that's that part of Zibar's argument that self-correction in science is hampered by the fact Journals don't publish replication studies and rarely publish negative findings, which still hold good. It, it holds good completely. And it holds good particularly in the world of the natural and clinical sciences. And what I mean by that is biology and medicine. Because in biology and medicine, a little more strongly than for other disciplines such as chemistry or even more physics or mathematics, there is a hierarchy of journals. So journals compete with each other to be high on the public perception totem pole. Scientists vie with each other to publish in those journals that are high profile. This has come to be, over, particularly over the past two decades, a sort of gamed system in which journals and scientists are mutual beneficiaries of a system that creates cliques and networks that perpetuate themselves as mandarins. In such a situation, because the science that you do needs to acquire this high profile, you would prefer to have positive data rather than negative. Because you are a journal that aspires to be high profile, you would prefer to publish positive data rather than negative, and so the vicious cycle continues. Um, and that vicious cycle, I think, therefore, has become a far more prominent feature of the life sciences and medicine 
research field than it has, for example, of the physics and mathematics community. Thanks, Satyajit. I think we have gone over this various facets of this issue. With the jury, as you said, is still out on the quality of the research that has been done. Particularly, I think the arsenic substitution, which has been claimed, though you say it's not been claimed in the paper, but certainly has been claimed all over the place, I think is something which is really open to serious question. So I think we'll come back and have a discussion after, hopefully, the replication studies or negative findings have come out. Thanks. Thank you.